our wonderful guests. Um, our guest tonight is Jeffrey T. Blackwell. It joined American Atheists in September of 2016. As litigation counsel, he responds to reports of possible violations of the separation between religion and government. Every, every year, he volunteers as a judge for the Philip P. Jessup International Law Mute Court Competition in which law students from 87 countries compete in a simulation of a fictional dispute between countries before the International Court of Justice. Wow, I'm impressed. He previously served as a member of the board of directors of the New Jersey Humanist Network. While earning his JD from Rutgers, he participated in the school's human rights advocacy and litigation clinic and served as the president of the Rutgers Camden International Law Society. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for being here. I'm glad that I roped you in to do a talk. <laughs> so, yay. So thank you for being here. And you may now start your presentation. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate you roping me in, first of all. So uh, thank you. And I'm happy to be here. Um, I do I do want to play down this being a presentation. I, 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 Unless you're in law school, you don't want to sit through a lecture on the law. Um, um, so fair. I do I, I do hope that there will be some back and forth, Kara and Helen, as you yes. have. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yes. Free to jump in. <laughs> We will um, talk with you. As you can see, we have no, I'm, no problem I'm talking. I'm so good at I, talking. <laughs> I didn't think it would be an issue, but for the audience, I didn't want them to think I was just going to sit here and, you know. Yes, this is not a PowerPoint. About, yeah, yeah, no, it's not. Um, yeah. I'm not Some putting, of our I'm topics work, work great with PowerPoints. Others of them, I think, like you said, people would be scared off by having to see a PowerPoint of, of legal documents yeah absolutely <laughs> and and i don't like making those slides so because there's not there's no way to make them fun <laughs> that's true that's true so we appreciate that you didn't do that and we are glad you're here to talk to us like real <laughs> humans that we are <laughs> well you're very welcome um yeah, and so oh, sorry go ahead oh no i was just gonna say we really appreciate that you were able to make the time because you are actually super busy doing all of this work that you're gonna describe to us and uh we don't like taking away your time from doing that but we are super excited that you were able to come and tell us about it so thank you yeah like i said you're you're very welcome um so i did i did collect a few topics um uh, one of which is touched on in in the poll that people are still responding to um but since it is the middle of August, um, I thought it was a good idea to touch on some issues that always crop up for my work every year in back to school season. Um, because as students are going back to school, especially now, as students are going back to school um, in this sort of post-COVID pandemic environment where, I, I mean, not having children myself, I'm not exactly sure whether there are even still any places that are like partly from home. I doubt it. It's been a year or so, I think, since any of that was really in effect. But um, now that students are back in school and interacting with teachers directly and interacting with staff directly, all these things, um, having to sit through moments of silence in the morning again, um, I think it's worth outlining some of the issues that people might um, encounter. Um, uh, so, the first one I want to touch on stems from a Supreme Court decision that was handed down last year, um, and it was Kennedy v. Bremerton School District. This case involved a, a um, football coach who was engaging in um, prayers on the 50-yard line immediately after football games. Some of you, maybe many of you, have heard about this case. Um, in the decision... The Supreme Court said that a, um, a a teacher or staff member engaging in um, private personal prayers uh, can't be disciplined essentially for doing that by uh, their school. Now, there are some big issues with whether what Coach Kennedy was actually doing was a personal private prayer, but the Supreme Court took his version of the facts. I quibble with his version of the facts, but regardless, um, what uh, the danger is that a lot of um, staff members, faculty members who are already inclined to um, 
be very forward with their religion when they're interacting with students will take this as an endorsement of that behavior. And it's not. Um, whether it's principals, teachers, uh, office staff, um, no school official can um, force students to participate in prayers, um, proselytize to students um, during coursework or outside of coursework. Um, uh, a uh, student, a religious student group can't get special access to the school district or to school facilities that, or school faculty that other student groups don't get. Um, and these are all things that we have to bear in mind as we approach the school year, because um, a, a lot of parents will hear from their students, or maybe um, a, a lot of students will encounter these sorts of behaviors and think that that is okay, um, and it's not. And if they encounter that, they should come to their parents. If, if you as a parent, I imagine we don't have too many um, people under 18 on the call, but that's possible. Um, but if you as a parent are concerned, because maybe you've heard about other things in your school district, or you are just in a small town or, or city in the Bible Belt, or you know, it can, it can really happen anywhere, unfortunately, but um, you have concerns and you talk to your child and find out that that's happening at school, we certainly want to hear about it because um, we have to make sure that our children's rights are being respected and that people aren't abusing their power uh, by imposing their views and beliefs on um, impressionable, impressionable children who have no choice but to be there. Uh, so I wanted to run through uh, a little bit of that with regard to prayers. Now, uh, and, oh, yeah. sorry, um, before you go on, like, could you say a little bit, or maybe you're going to touch on this later, but like for anybody that's not aware, what is the legal basis for uh, these rules? Why is it that that we're allowed to say, hey, this isn't allowed in these circumstances? Sure. So um, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution uh, does a number of things with regard to religion. Um, first, it says that the government cannot establish religion. And the rules around the Establishment Clause are um, are very much in flux right now. <laughs> um, uh, but the one thing, uh, one of the things that is um, really unassailable when it comes to the Establishment Clause is that the government cannot coerce you into religious practice. Um, and there is a string of Supreme Court cases um, going back to Ingle v. Vitale from the 50s, um, Abington School District v. Shemp, which American Atheist founder was a plaintiff in um, back in 1963. Um, up through the 90s, there's um, uh, Santa Fe Independent School District, Levy, Weissman. There's a string of cases that, that outline um, the boundary between where a school is coercing religious activity and, and where the school is allowing students to engage in, you know, the exercise of their religion, which they it must to a certain extent, as long as it doesn't disrupt the school environment. A student is perfectly able to exercise their religion, um, and the same is true for school employees outside of class time. Um, it's different when you're in front of your students. And even outside of class time, they can't impose their beliefs on, on students. Um, so because there's a tension there when the school is uh, when the school is both working as an employer of people who have their own private beliefs and also caretaker for students, and they the school has obligations that can sometimes be in tension. Um, Right now, given the state of the Supreme Court, that tension is being resolved very often in favor of religion rather than secular government. That's a problem. Um, that's going to be an ongoing fight for the next 30 years, uh, however long. Um, but nonetheless, it, it is a balance that school districts have to strike, and some school districts are better at it than others. Um, some teachers that are, are better at it than others. And so it's it's just a matter of making sure that we are keeping a watchful eye on our civil servants. Um, I touched on there, um, student groups. And um, 
the fact that a school district, as long as the school district allows students to organize into groups that, you know, maybe student government um, does fundraisers that support all recognized student groups and things like that. Um, and they can be religious groups. This, the school cannot exclude religious or, or specifically non-religious um, student groups from participating in such a program. Um, because to do so would be discriminating against religion, and that is also not allowed. Um, so if you're uh, something that parents and their children can be thinking of as they go back to school is, are there um, student groups for non-religious children at the school um, that can provide them with very often some much needed community? Because while I could say personally, um, you know, I, I happened to go to a string of school districts. I moved around a lot growing up, but I happened to go to a string of school districts, including in Salt Lake City, um, that were actually very good about keeping religion out of the classroom. Um, their sex ed could have been better, but <laughs> um, but nevertheless, they kept religion out of the classroom. Um, but I know that in that I am maybe not in the minority, but certainly not wholly representative, but also a lot of uh, the, a lot of the hardships I had in school when I was attending public school came from the other students. And, and that's something that, that parents and school districts really need to take into account. Um, it can be hard as a non-religious student to find community. Growing up in uh, well, at least spending two years in Salt Lake City, I didn't have a lot of friends among the Mormon uh, students because I was Catholic at the time. Um, and there's some tension between the Mormon church and the Catholic church. Um, so finding friends was a challenge. Um, and I also was subjected to a lot of bullying growing up because specifically because uh, in I was, though I was raised Catholic, I was identifying as an atheist is as early as middle school. And um, so I, I got, you know, oh, you're going to go to hell, you're, you know, you, you've got to believe in God, or you're going to, you know, be a, or you're just a terrible person for because you don't believe uh, from other students. And, uh, and so it's important that students have community um, in the school environment. Um, and also, it's important that schools recognize that their anti-bullying policies need to be enforced in a way that's not discriminatory. Someone should not be able to get away with bullying just because they're coming from a religious perspective or, or you know, the teacher, the teacher may not even see that as bullying. They may see it as, well, she, she's just trying to, you know, save your soul. I don't, I don't care if it fits the definition of bullying, it's bullying and it needs to be enforced as such. Um, and so it's important to talk to your children or if you are attending school to, to be aware of these things. Um, and if a school district or a principal is not enforcing the rules equitably, um, steps need to be taken to make sure that they do. Um, and I don't want to, I, I, I picked those words. They don't enforce, not enforcing the rules equitably um, very carefully because I don't want to imply that they're doing it intentionally or with any sort of ill will. It simply may not have occurred to them because it can be difficult to put yourself in someone else's perspective when it comes to something as basic as, you know, f a fundamental worldview questions. Um, and, and they simply may not have thought about the issue before um, yeah that's a really good point that it may not even be malicious but that i mean thinking that far outside of one's worldview if you haven't thought about the fact that you're coming from a particular perspective you might not even realize the alternative <laughs> perspectives and possibilities here or mm -hmm. that something wrong is happening that's that's a really interesting point yeah it's um you know we had a we had a student who was a plaintiff of ours a while back against a school district down in the Houston, Texas area, who was bullied for sitting out the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, she remembers being told by a school official, a, a, a teacher had a, a not very positive interaction with her and a, another school official said, well, he's a veteran, he can, you know, he can voice his 
perspective there. And whether he's a veteran or not, uh, whether, uh, you know, someone, uh, regardless of, uh, of a teacher or school official's views, um, you can't compel a student to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, you can't compel a student to um, put up with any, any essentially compelled um, religious exercise, political exercise. Um, this all goes back to a, a Supreme Court case called uh, Tinker v. Des Moines. Um, and um, so in the 1940s, um, where, and it actually, well, I won't, I, I won't, I won't go dive deep into the to facts of that case, but it, it, it was the Pledge of Allegiance and, and a student being forced to, to stand and recite it. Um, and the Supreme Court was very clear that, that no official, high or petty, uh, can force a person to confess a belief in something um, that that they don't agree with, um, or they can't force you to come to profess something that even if you do agree with it, that's compelled speech and and not allowed. Um, and we as uh, as atheists tend to focus a lot of our attention when it comes to legal discussions on the establishment clause. We should not give short shrift to the free speech clause that allows us to. A, refrain from uh, saying under God, or you know, if you are, um, you know, signing citizenship papers, you can cross out "So help me God" on the oath on the paperwork because they can't force you to say "So help me God." Um, I, as a as an attorney, was sworn in um, uh, using an oath that ostensibly had um, "So help me God" on it, um, but I didn't say that part, and that's perfectly permissible. Um, I'm kind of digressing from the, the subject a little bit. We're talking about schools. Um, That's okay. It's still on topic. It's tangentially related. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is what happens if you just let a lawyer talk. We'll just not stop. <laughs> well, everything is kind of interwoven to each other though, because if we're talking about the broader concept of like government and we're talking about public education and public access and that everything gets interwoven into those um, into those systems. Like if you're talking about the pledge, for example, um, and under constitutional law, you're not compelled or or forced to say the pledge. And then you have a student that's just like, I don't want to say it. And then you know, um, and then by compelled speech, the school or whatever wants them to say it. It gets interwoven into these conversations that we're having. So it's multi-layered. It's just, you know, you can't separate one from the other when we're talking about public institutions within the United States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's and it can be very hard to draw those lines. Um, um and this is another thing too that I think really illustrates how. Uh, there are a lot of, um, I guess, uh, self-appointed attorneys who live on the interwebs who are there to tell you what their rights are and, you know, what this case means and this and that and the other. But even just from hearing you describe it, it briefly and having looked into it a little bit myself, like, there's a lot that goes into these decisions. It's not just a matter of, I read the First Amendment and this is what it means to me. There's a great deal of litigation that has been done over this and legal precedent that seems to be informing each of these specific instances that I imagine you have to go through quite a long time of school to learn all of. Yeah, and and I'll say the three years of law school is not enough time to get good at it for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and especially when it comes to the Establishment Clause, the Supreme Court very recently made some major, uh, well, has been in the process of making some major changes. Uh, you know, the the lemon test that that many of us have uh, become familiar with over the years is is no longer applicable um, in favor of uh, looking to what was what's been permissible in our history and traditions, um, mm -hmm. which is the so fuzzy I can't even call it a test. Um, there's um, it's a disturbing trend right now in in the courts where um, they're they're replacing a lot of um, very clear, straightforward if um, if dense tests for um, the legality of particularly First Amendment questions and replacing those tests with um, these, very fuzzy um, case by case basis um, analyses that 
whenever I hear someone say there's no bright line rule for deciding X, I cannot help but think what they mean is if we apply a bright line rule, I won't like the result. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so it always, whenever, whenever we start getting rid of clear rules in favor of, well, we'll take every case as it comes. Um, I get very worried because it allows judges to impose their own subjective views on a case and weigh things in ways that um, that maybe a bright line test wouldn't. But also, it means you have to litigate everything. If there's no clear answers, then the only way to find out is to go to court. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you as an attorney, I don't like going to court. That is the last resort. It takes the, the case I mentioned earlier against uh, the school district in Houston, um, that started in 2017 and it took five years. Um, the student was essentially done with college by the time we were done litigating over what she experienced her freshman year of high school. Um, it, and um, that cannot be the way that we determine what someone's rights are. Um, partly because it will, in, I mean, when there are no clear rules, government officials are going to more often than not hew toward avoiding anything that even approaches this fuzzy line. And in a country where, you know, still 75% of the country is, or 70% now is um, Christian by some denomination, um, and the sort of knee-jerk reaction that we see of people claiming their religion, you know, exempts them from basic vaccination rules that protect the public health, um, all these different things. Um, more often than not, the government will just defer to the person seeking an exemption from the law rather mm -hmm. than face years of litigation over it. Um, and, and so it's it, anyway, it's a troubling trend toward getting getting rid of clear rules that is um, in the long run going to be very damaging, uh, regardless of what the outcomes are. Just the process is harmful to people's rights. But do you think that's like baked into the system? Because um, we all know that like justice can move at the rate of molasses and which is a good and a bad thing because Obviously, we want all the evidence and all the arguments presented forward in a way that can be analyzed. But on like the the good point that you brought up is like they were already in college when this case got brought before the court. So in that regard, it's one of those things that is just like, well, what are we doing this for now? And I'm hoping it's because the next person that comes up and um, makes a stink about things will be validated. You know, but it for and I understand this because like I'm the type of person like um, I would have liked it yesterday, but I'll take it now type of person. And there's some things that I find very frustrating, um, especially the way the court is going um, within the United States um, with the with the new Supreme Court. And um, I have a lot of concerns um, that they're going to go back to they're going back to old presidents that's over like 200 years old and going back to all these old ideas which is gives me pause because it's like are you addressing the concerns of actual people that are living in the united states now that we have to have president of some type of law that you know that we can show you know evidence for but at the same time why are you going back 200 years because obviously the world has changed since then. And it gives, and it, it concerns me because obviously I, I want all the courts to, even if it's justice that I don't agree with, at least it's based on something that is within the law that has shown precedent and um, would per perceive to be fair, even though I might not think it's fair. But living in the in the United States now, especially as an American and someone that's an atheist and wants that separation of church and state, that I'm that I'm just always like, oh no, oh no, and that's the concern that I have. That because it moves so slow, that we're going to there that a lot of the courts are relying on the fact that it moves so slow. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that is certainly built into the system. The, the courts are supposed to be, uh, uh, by design, the courts are rooted in 
you know, precedent that in some cases goes back to, um, you know, the Magna Carta, depending on what area of law you're talking about. Um, and we're the court system to the extent it was designed. I mean, the, the constitution creates a Supreme court and then basically said, and Congress figure out the rest, um, which worked fine for a couple hundred years ish. Um, and I'm fine is doing a lot of work there. There, was, there were plenty of terrible cases, um, uh, you know, before the 1970s. Absolutely. Um, but our, political system has broken down to the extent that, you know, basically no law gets made unless it's passing a, you know, tax bill or a military, um, uh, I'm forgetting the acronym now for um, the, um, the, the authorization of military actions and whatnot. Um, there's an, an acronym that's just escaping me in this moment. Um, you got me. Regardless. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's not as though we can seriously expect Congress to step in when the courts say, you know, the, this is this is what the law says, this is what the Constitution says, and if you don't like it, then, you know, vote in people who are going to change the law. Um, that's increasingly less of an option for many people who live in, you know, very highly gerrymandered districts along political lines. Um, and political lines are more often, uh, more and more often also falling along religious lines, um, which raises some questions of its own. Um, so, uh, in answer to to the extent that that was a, a question, um, yes, it was um, designed to take time. It's where you're trying to ostensibly reach the truth, um, and and they expected that that would take time. Uh, unfortunately, the other branches of our government have have fallen down on the job, and um, you also gave a very nice summary of why um, originalism. Uh, as a judicial philosophy is wrong. <laughs> um, mm. um, there is, uh, since since the 1980s, there's this push a lot on the conservative side of the um, legal world um, toward uh, interpreting the constitution, statutes, everything uh, by what the people who passed those laws adopted uh, or ratified the constitution, ratified whatever amendment, um, what they thought at the time it meant. And you, you can't, you don't have perfect knowledge of what everyone who made that decision thought. Many of them were in conflict with each other. And um, and the founders didn't think that that was, if, if you're a, an originalist, you shouldn't be because the founders thought originalism was dumb. There's, if you go... <laughs> Now we're really digressing, but it's fine. If if you go to the Jefferson Memorial on the Mall in D.C., there's several quotes inscribed like 50 feet high on the wall. One of which is basically telling originalists to grow up and put their big person pants on, and <laughs> and um, they don't like to quote any of those any of those lines from Jefferson. But mm, oh, well. well, it seems like this the romantic. Um, romantics of American democracy have this like you know like what well, what was enshrined by the founding fathers is like what how we are supposed to behave today but when when that shows a, like Tom like Jefferson going like no no we're we have to change um I think that goes goes in the face of a lot of those traditionalists that want to say that like well the president was sent you know 250 years ago we should still be following that and the rest of us are like well should should, should we should we do that yeah <laughs> well, and I, speaking I, of oh go ahead Oh, no, I was just gonna say, like, I, I think it's very dangerous too when people are relying on you know these are our traditions and our history it, in that you know, sometimes we invent traditions and imagine that things were a certain way previously or that the way our grandparents were is the way everyone's grandparents were and, and so on. And we begin kind of narrowing the repertoire of traditions and beliefs available to people by suggesting that only mine are the real traditions. Anyone else's traditions or anyone else's perspectives are not valid. That seems not compatible 
with well Kara, we need to go back to the time when you could beat your wife with a switch that was no bigger than your thumb that which was the standard and in, in the late 70, 70 right. all, 70s all traditions are good oh, clearly yeah, right <laughs> yes why <Kind> change <laughs> yeah the saying <laughs> yeah well, um, okay, yeah, I, I interrupted you. You were going to tell us something important. I was just going to say, I know I, I called it a digression, but it actually kind of segues into the next thing I want to talk about, which is uh, relates to our poll, one of the poll questions, yes. at least. Um, Would you uh, like me to show the poll questions? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. All right, let me pull those up so we can look at those while you discuss. Okay, here they are. So people so it's, can see those. Oh, yeah, go ahead. People can see it? Okay. Yeah. Um, it is coming up on once again election season 2024 is right around the corner we're about five months from the first of the caucuses and primaries uh and i know everyone is looking forward to that <laughs> um uh but i i wanted to highlight some recent statistics and encourage people to engage with their public officials because according to uh ryan burge who's a uh uh how to describe I, I was about to say statistician but that's kind of downplaying uh, he's, he's sort of a, a sociologist of the current religious uh the the current religious demographics of the country um and uh, he crunched some numbers and 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 uh, came to the conclusion that the non-religious particularly atheists and agnostics are the most politically engaged community when you break the country down on those sort of religious lines. Um, and I think that's really important and I wanna highlight it because it has not even very recently been the case. We need to um, be engaging with our elected officials. We need to be engaging with our candidates and letting them know that we have interests just like um, our, our religious um, neighbors and um, and they represent if if they win office or if they are in office, they represent us just as much as they represent um, uh, believers. And we struggle sometimes to do that for a number of reasons. Obviously, there's stigma attached to being an atheist, so we use a lot of different words, whether it's secular, non-religious, free thinker, skeptic. These are all perfectly valid descriptors. Um, the problem is the elected officials by and large don't know that those all essentially mean the same thing. Um, and I, it, the, when you think about how believers tend to interact with, um, with government officials, I'm a Christian and I think that, and this, you, I'm in favor of you voting for this bill, bill because such and such. Um, and so they have a bucket in their head where they, okay, that's one Christian constituent who thinks that, and they, you know, to the extent they are trying to respond to what their constituents want, um, uh, you know, they're putting people in sort of those mental buckets. Obviously, this is a crude analogy, but it's one that's reasonably communicable. <laughs> um, and so when you know, so they'll have a they'll have a bucket in their mind that says atheist, and one that says agnostic, and one that says skeptic, and one that says non non religious or free thinker or what have you, and and they all look like they're almost empty. But if you put them all together, it would be about a third of all the water in all the buckets. <laughs> um, wow, that's a large percentage. A third. I if you factor in um, what we know about the statistics of people who are closeted yes mm. um wow. so, so this is does this include religious people that or is this, this is just non cycle like i'm talking here about the non-religious okay um, like well like spiritual like it would we include spiritual within that or i just don't follow a religion um I'm not sure if that is factored into the roughly a third I just quoted. I, I mean, yeah, I'm just, I don't I, have I'm the just, statistics. I, I'm all me. about, I'm, um, this is my nuanced question that I'm trying to figure things out. <laughs> no, it's, it, and it's difficult to distinguish between, because um, mm -hmm. a lot of pollsters talk about the nuns, N O N E S, um, which does include people who are um, believers but aren't members of a particular sect. Um, 
and uh, the spiritual, but not religious. You know, they don't go to church, but they believe in something higher, some higher power. Um, whereas the non-religious tend to be non-believers. Uh, at least that's how I'm. I look at it. Um, so there's a lot of it. It, it can be difficult to parse. <laughs> I'll say that much. Well, and that's why I'm asking because um, I like I I think it's great that it's a third. Like I think that's fantastic. But I'm always like, well, are they atheists or are they just not affiliate affiliated with like an organized religion? You know, and that can. But either way, like I'm happy because I'm just like, okay, well, well, you you know, you're you know, you're kind of you're kind of leaning towards our side, and I'm like, cool. <laughs> right. At least you're going your own way. And right. That, exactly. That counts for something. Yeah. It when makes it, it far to... less likely you're going to impose it on someone else, and that's really what I care exactly. about. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's the important piece. So, um, let me real quickly read the results of the poll, if that's okay for sure. for our listeners who are are hearing the audio only. Um, so the first question was, have you interacted with an elected official or candidate on social media other than just following or liking posts? 20% of our participants tonight said yes, 74% uh, said no, and 6% were not sure. So we may be a, a little low in our engagement compared to the numbers you were you were telling us, although that was a different set of numbers. Um, but um, the second question was also interesting. Do you know if there is a religious test for public office in your state? 23% of people answered yes, which I think meant yes, they know whether or not there is one. And 51% of people do not know whether or not there is one. And 26% of people are not sure or don't live in the US. So uh, the majority of people, it seems, aren't sure which is high. Um, and then uh, additionally, while, while you ponder your response to that, I'll read the most important question of the evening, which is who is the best Star Trek That's captain? the one we all care about. Yeah. This came down to a really a neck and neck race between Kirk and Picard, which is not what I thought was going to happen. But uh, I, you know, I'm here for it. 37% of people selected Kirk, 40% selected Picard. We had 3% like for Janeway. That's a new split. Oh, you bitches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 6% for Pike. <laughs> Woo. That's who I would have voted for. If I, I would have voted for Pike and my um, modern Trek fandom. Yes. 3% for Saru. <laughs> and 11% said other. And I know there's been a little bit of discussion going in the chat, but I would like to know who the others are because we did run out of options. We weren't able to to give any more options than these. We know there are other options. I'm also kind of disappointed that Mirror Lorca didn't get any votes because, you know. If there are any Jericho stands out there, I'd really like to know. Yeah. Let us know. But okay, there we go. Feel free to comment on the serious questions if you would like to about this religious test for public office, or we can continue carrying on about Star Trek captains. But I recommend we do that in the Hangout. You can you can post in the chat of your dissenting opinions, and you know why we're still having the adult discussion. Right. <laughs> And then we'll have the real adult discussion in the hangout. That's but, yeah. Well, we'll have the hangout and we'll have the real debate. Yeah. But, but what is this religious test for public office? Can you tell us a little more about that? Sure. So the federal constitution prohibits any religious tests for public office in the U S government. Um, and uh, it took a while. It was a case, Torcaso v. Watkins, involving uh, this, uh, an official, well, someone who sought to be a, a notary public in the state of Maryland, um, who was, I uh, can't remember how he identified, but non-religious, a non-believer, and um, was denied the opportunity to be um, a notary public. And up until then, it was sort of an open question whether that uh, well, it wasn't even an open question. Plenty of states had rules against um, non-believers holding public office, and they were enforced. And it was that case um, uh, 60 years ago now that said that no, states as well as the federal government are prohibited from imposing religious tests on public office or, or positions of public trust is sometimes the word, uh, the, the wording that's used. Um, however, plenty of states still have those requirements on the books, even though existing precedent from 60 years ago says they're not 
legally enforceable. Um, I know we have at least a couple of people on this call who have um, uh, had personal interaction with this, uh, with these sorts of provisions. There are even states, um, I'm thinking in particular of Arkansas that have on the books still uh, prohibitions against atheists being sworn in as witnesses in court because they can't swear an oath to God, so we can't trust them. Um, because clearly no one who's sworn an oath to God has ever lied in court before. Right. Yeah. That is the assumption that's being made there, which is so laughably stupid. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Interesting. Interesting thought process. <laughs> it, it's it's pretty silly. But the fact that these are still on the books, this kind of circles back to what I, uh, you know, when I was going to school in Maryland, um, uh, in middle school and high school, there were um, you know, I was bullied by students and it, they may not, the, the, the childhood bullies are certainly not aware of the constitutional provisions in question, but the fact that these are still on the books gives support to an environment that ostracizes non-believers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there are efforts in a number of states to remove these from the books, um, and, and get various or their constitutional provisions to get them removed by, you know, um, ballot measures, particularly there's um, one um, working its way through Maryland right now. Um, and so anyway, it's, it's important to, to get rid of those vestiges of um, a much more discriminatory past, mm -hmm. particularly because in an environment where right now the Supreme Court is wiping away a lot of the recent protections that have been put in place, um, we need to make sure that that old laws that have been forgotten don't get resurrected, to use Ooh. some religious terminology. Yeah, and um, do you suppose that that is perhaps the reason that some of these older laws stay on the books? Like, for example, I remember when I was studying the penal code in police school uh, way back in the day uh, in, in Texas, and we learned about sodomy laws, which are still on the books right. in Texas. But of course, you know, you were taught, yes, this is in the penal code. Yes, this looks like this is the law in Texas. However, subsequent court cases have struck this down. This is not enforceable, but it remains in the books. And, you know, you proceed to have all of the snickering and jokes and, you know, raunchy comments that are then made about it in the class. And it just, it makes one wonder if the reason this hasn't been taken off the books is because there is some contention of people who are hoping that later those court cases that struck it down will themselves be struck down, and this can can then again be the law of the land. D do you think that that's what's going on here? I think it's a mix of things. That's certainly an aspect. That uh, you know, certainly in the case of um, restrictions on abortion, um, even when they were unenforceable under Roe, there was a you know a generation long movement to reverse that um, legal precedent that just succeeded. And we saw, you know, 100 year old statutes leap back into effect. Um, I think that's certainly part of it. I also think that I think a, a big part of it, though, on the um, on things that are not quite as controversial as abortion in this country. Um, it's just a, a lack of willingness on the part of elected officials to their to devote their time to something that they think is a non-issue. Well, the Supreme Court's resolved it. Why do we have to spend time re removing it from, from the books? And, you know, there's something to that. They do have to put together a bill that strikes it and, and you know, vote and have debate and pass it. And, and, mm. um, and that all takes time. And I'm sure, especially on our issues, there are plenty of elected officials who don't want to be um, you know, sponsoring the bill that takes God out of the constitution of the state or whatever, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because it would, you know, redound to them negatively at the polling box, uh, or at the polling station, the next, uh, the ballot box or the polling station. I'm mixing my, my metaphors, but, um, it's not even yeah. a metaphor. I'm just mixing my things. But, um, <laughs> I do want to ask a question. Hard. I do want to ask a question. Um, like for the abortion law, it was not codified. 
um, into constitutional, um, you know, federal constitutional law, you know, yeah. the way that, you know, um, same sex marriage was. And I'm curious um, why that was the decision, you know, which has now led to where we are now, where, you know, it's come down to state's law. Um, I'm sure there's some kind of um, complicated argument or decision that was made that I do not understand. So for our audience, I would, you know, why on a legal president, why it was not codified. Um, and because this also applies to other laws that are going to affect like the mass populace of the United States just outside of abortion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, codifying it in a, in, in a way that would have been most effective would have required a constitutional amendment. And um, and we haven't amended the Constitution, I think, while I've been alive. Um, it is a significant challenge to do that. Um, and on issues that are controversial, we still, I mean, it there's still the risk, uh, I think, a pretty large risk that the Supreme Court could reverse a lot of the um recent protections that have been put in place uh, for the LGBT community. Um, those are more and more being protected by state laws and state constitutions, but it's not um, protected in the text of, uh, I mean, you have to interpret the text of the, of the Equal Protection Act or Equal Protection Act, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment um, to find it there. And I think it's easy to find it there, but it is not strictly in the text. Um, and so that's still a danger as much, uh, you know, um, as many statutes take into account and pro uh, prohibit anti-discrimination, uh, prohibit anti-discrimination. It is getting late. Wow. <laughs> Prohibiting discrimination on the basis of gender identity, gender, um, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, all of these things. Uh, those laws can be reversed as well. Um, and so it's it's an ongoing fight in all of these instances. Um, as to why they weren't, I think it very often just comes down to lack of political capital and having too many things to do um, and too few ways to do them. <laughs> So it's complicated, like everything yeah. else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes sense what you were saying, too, about, yeah. you know, the, the political risk that someone takes to take something off the books that's already not in effect. So you're essentially changing next to nothing, but putting yourself in a precarious position to do it. Why? What's the payoff unless you have, you know, a really strong conviction about it? Right. And and uh, part of the payoff that I think people need to think more about is what you talked about, where, you know, the penal code still has these old laws and not every officer is going to know all the precedents that impact all of those all of those um, sections of the penal code. So yeah, they may. I, I'm here to tell you, they, they don't make police officers go through three years of law school. <laughs> No. Um, and and I think they should make lawyers go through maybe more. I don't know. Uh, law school is, uh, that's a different, that's a different question. Um, but the law is confusing. And I, you know, I, I've had this conversation with people before, and I'm going to not take us off on a tangent here. But, you know, it's, it is written in a very confusing way. It is a lot yeah. to expect people to understand it clearly and enforce it, you know, with a moment's time to consider, you know, has the law been violated or not and in what way and which statute. It's tough. And when it's written with all these extraneous things in it, it doesn't help. I can't yeah. tell you that. As someone that's involved in their own lawsuit, when I have to read it, like read the legal documents, I'm like, I don't, and I'm talking, and I go to my husband, who is a para, that has a paralegal degree. I'm like, explain, explain things to me. I confuse because <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of um, jargon in there that if you are, if you don't understand it um, to the layman like myself, is overwhelming and mm -hmm. frustrating. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it, I can say it's frustrating to me too. And I do this. Uh, and you do it for a living. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, what makes things more accessible to me is stories. And I hear you are going to tell us some stories about some recent Supreme Court cases and maybe a particular case you were involved in. Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, I do want to mention before we yeah. Uh, completely changed topic because this relates this this relates back um yeah. uh right now 
um, the Supreme Court is considering two cases that deal with people interacting with their elected officials on social media and whether and to what extent the First Amendment applies um, to, a, a, you know, the comment space below the, you know, local, you know, your your city council members public Facebook page um, and to what extent they can block you um, or or delete your comments and things like that. Um, and so that'll be interesting. I am filing an amicus with the Supreme Court tomorrow on one of those cases, um, uh, O'Connor Ratcliffe v. Garnier or Garnier. Not sure how it's pronounced. Depends um, on if you're shampooing your hair with it or not. Is right. A, <laughs> um, and Garn uh, Garn Garner for the lawyer stuff. Garnier if you're doing beauty stuff. I, right. I'm gonna. That's that's. I I say it's official, and now it's now now yeah. now it's that, real. That it's now definitive. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's not definitive. I mean, I mean it. It's done. <laughs> you're, you're gotcha. And the other one is is Lindkey v. Freed. Um, but they both deal with this question of when do we know whether or not some, when is a public official on social media as an official or as a private individual or someone campaigning for office? Because the First Amendment allows them, the elected officials in their private capacity to engage in speech. Um, and, you know, when they are campaigning, they can exclude someone from a campaign event, but if they're doing a uh, town hall to inform the people of their district of things going on with their work, um, then they can't exclude people because they're that person is a critic or or what have you. Um, so when is someone on Facebook or Twitter or Mastodon or um, any of the now blue sky, I guess, uh, <laughs> um, when are they acting in their official capacity? And this is another area where lines are getting very fuzzy. Um, oh. and so this would have to do with, for example, like whether they're allowed to block someone from their page for coming on and asking them a series of pointed questions. <laughs> exactly. Huh. Um, and as, as the, you know, um, as the, I'll say religious demographic, because that's the way statisticians talk about it. Um, but um, as the most engaged community, um, I, I think it is very important that we remain so, that we interact with our elected officials and protect our rights when they censor us, um, mm -hmm. because they do. We had a lawsuit against uh, a lawmaker down in Arkansas, um, uh, Jason Rapert, uh, and I have to land pretty hard on the T there. Um, uh, to make sure I'm not defaming him in some way, <laughs> um, uh, was uh, blocking people um, who were critical of his um, Christian nationalist actions. Um, and uh, Trump faced a lawsuit over blocking people from his Twitter account that went all the way up to the Supreme Court right before he lost election and so became a moot uh, case and was uh, was kicked because there was then nothing to talk about. Um, um, so uh, it's important that we engage and that we we defend our rights. Uh, so it's something we need to be keeping an eye on in the coming term, uh, Supreme Court term that starts in October. Mm. But uh, you mentioned the case I was involved in that's beyond just an amicus brief. An amicus brief is just anybody, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a secret, any lawyer can be a member of the Supreme Court bar for like $200. And mm. at that point, you can submit an amicus to the Supreme Court on any case if you can show you have some interest in it. Um, so it's not any sort of, uh, I don't know, feather in your cap to be able to do, <laughs> to do that. Um, uh, but the case that, that we just resolved, uh, partially, was on behalf of a prisoner in West Virginia, an incarcerated inv individual in West Virginia. I'm trying to get away from using the word prisoner. Um, an incarcerated individual in West Virginia who was um, essentially told, you will not be eligible for parole unless you complete this 12-step program uh, that we have. Um, and it's a federally funded program. Um, the, Fed the Department of Justice funds um, residential substance abuse treatment programs in um, state corrections departments around the country. It's called the RSAT program. 
Um, it is supposed to be for, um, uh, well, it is for the uh, helping inmates recover from substance abuse disorders. Um, unfortunately, in West Virginia, it was pervasively religious. Um, it, it depended entirely on the 12 step program. Um, there were like morning and evening, there are still, I think, morning and evening devotional exercises for those participating in it. You, uh, and when you're participating in the program, you live in the unit dedicated to only the, um, uh, the incarcerated individuals who are in that program. Um, uh, there's, uh, there was basically only religious reading material made available in the common spaces. If you wanted something else, you had to go request it. Um, there were phrases like let go, let God painted on the walls by inmates and just left there um, by government officials. Um, he asked repeatedly our client for a an exemption for some sort of accommodation. He, he asked for um, therapy. He asked for let me participate in smart recovery, life ring, SOS, these secular alternatives to AA and NA, and they just refused. Um, and so we sued on his behalf. And um, a month ago now, um, we, I guess it was, it was July 18th, uh, the court handed down a preliminary injunction that forces the state to remove the requirement that he participate in the RSAT program from his, essentially from his parole um, requirements. And um, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we uh, what we wanted to happen. Um, but I know he's not the only one in West Virginia or around the country who is being required, whether by a prison system or um, a social worker, a, a parole officer, a probation officer, mm -hmm. um, a drug uh, you know a drug court program to participate in twelve step uh, in twelve step programs that. Every court to address the issue has said are religious in nature and you cannot force people to participate in them. The federal government, the DOJ, in their guidance for this program says 12-step uh, programs can be available. They have to be funded through separate funding streams and participation in those has to be completely voluntary. You can make them available, but you can't require people to participate in them. Yet West Virginia made it the like central core, basically the only thing in their program. Um, not the only thing, like 75% of their program. So they were already in violation of this rule just to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, okay, just what did not care? I mean, how does this happen? Well, the federal government, the DOJ has a lot on its plates and um, being able to audit all of the state's um, programs can be challenging. I think they should be doing more. Um, we are hoping that this victory will um, help convince them that they should be paying more attention to how this program is administered. We'll have to wait and see. Um, there is a sense from a lot of government officials that this isn't a problem that needs addressing. Um, case in point, in New York, just last year, um, a bill was passed by the legislature that would have required um, judges, when sentencing someone to uh, to go to substance abuse treatment in whatever form, uh, to let them know they had the right to non-religious alternatives, ask them if they wanted a non-religious alternative, um, and Governor Hochul vetoed it because, in part, uh, for, uh, she gave a few reasons, one being she didn't think it was a problem. And the second being, well, if, if we're going to require judges to inform people of this right that they have, then where does that end? Are, are we going to have judges informing people of all their rights? And my answer is, yes. why aren't we doing that already? Right, um, right. <laughs> yes, because this is, you know, basic human rights and decency kind of stuff. Like she, she accidentally yeah. said the quiet part out loud there. And, and, and back to what you were saying about the NA and AA and with um, prisoners that um, I, I tend to think that because they are prisoners that the general populace has this attitude like, well, they don't get the same rights under, under the law, which is a problem because yes, we understand they're incarcerated 
and we could have a debate about the incarceration issue, blah, 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 blah. But what it comes down to is that there's some basic human rights people are allowed even when they are institutionalized. And for some reason, I think another reason why that this had to escalate to the point that it was is the fact that people don't regard prisoners as actual human beings under the same rights of the law. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a big problem. I mm -hmm. think that's part of why many states have gotten away with depriving people of their right to vote long after their sentences have run. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're not once someone's sentence is run, they're said to have you know served their time. They've they've paid for the whatever crime it was, and um, so to forever deprive them of their right to vote is a huge problem. Um, incarcerated individuals have essentially all their constitutional rights still. The only question is the balance shifts a little bit in favor of preserving the purpose of the prison system and the safety and security of, of the public. Um, and the courts are loath to tell prison officials how to run prisons, um, uh, but sometimes they have to. And in this case they did uh, because there are no security concerns here. There is no penological reason to require this particular individual to participate in a 12-step program. Um, well, yeah. and now, okay, so how did you get involved in that case? And follow-up question, what should people do if they believe that they are being subjected to some kind of situation like this, whether it's from an institutionalized situation or uh, just they for some reason think that that their rights are being violated and that some government entity is not observing uh, these rules that they are supposed to be how do they deal with that sure i won't get into the specifics of uh, uh, you know how a particular client communicates with me um but um uh, uh, our client came to us with a problem um and um uh, the way anyone can do that is by um, going to American Atheist's website, and uh, I believe it's atheists, A-T-H-E-I-S-T-S dot O-R-G slash report hyphen A hyphen violation. Um, and there's a straightforward form you fill out, um, you know, contact information so that I can ask you follow-up questions, and then let us know what the problem is. Um, and and we will take a look at it. I, I will mention um, we have a triage system when when cases come to us, um, plenty of plenty of things are irritating, but not legally actionable. Um, and and I do my best to explain if something is not legally actionable, and you kind of just have to grit your teeth and get through it. Um, but then plenty of things are actionable, and um, we have certain issues that we're focusing on where we think we can make strategic. Um, gains in the law. Um, it, we've identified certain areas where we think even in the present environment, we can make positive change. Um, and given American Atheist is not the largest of the um, non-religious national organizations by any means, and we have an, uh, an obligation to shepherd our resources in a way that's most effective. So we have a triage system where uh, a lot of cases I will refer to um, Americans United or American Humanist Association, FFRF, uh, CFI, because all of, the, all of our sister organizations have areas of expertise. Um, and, you know, CFI has their secular celebrants program. So if someone comes to me saying, I want to get married, but they're being, uh, you know, I want my friend to marry me, but he's, uh, I'm a, I want my friend to not marry me, but um, <laughs> I want my friend to officiate at Offici our wedding. Officiate your wedding, um, yeah. Presumably, a... you know, whoever you're wanting to marry is a friend. <laughs> wow. um, CFI has uh, a whole um, sort of system set up for uh, for dealing with those. Um, a AHA has done a lot of work in particularly uh, adoption and foster care uh, lately. Um, so we have this triage system. So I wouldn't be surprised if someone brings a complaint to us that I might refer them uh, to uh, one of our sister organizations. If it falls within the scope of what we're doing, we're focusing a lot on free speech, as I mentioned with our student who was harassed for the Pledge of Allegiance, people being censored on uh, on social media. Um, uh, and, uh, and a number of other areas that we're really trying to 
um, push things in a positive direction, like with substance abuse. And the reason that Daryl and I have been on a couple of panels now talking specifically about that recently. Um, anyway, we keep those in house and um, do factual investigation to uh, shore up as many facts as we can, because we want to make sure that when we bring a case, it is as solid as possible, given how hostile the courts are right now to the claims of non-religious people. Um, is yeah. it, so as you just mentioned, the courts being hostile, are they still receptive to actually hearing um, arguments that have to do with like legal precedent and actually what is right under the law? Or do you find this lean there like, well, it was not um, religious or, or um, violating certain types of people's rights that they um, you're finding how you're arguing and people that are within your circle, how you're arguing these cases have, has shifted over the past couple of years. <laughs> oh, things have certainly shifted. And, okay. and there, are, there are cases that I would have taken when I started my job seven years ago that I would not take today. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, it's, it, it is a question of which claims you raise and how you and how you lay out your arguments. There mm -hmm. are compelling arguments to be made, even to the most conservative judges, um, for why they should, you know, take our client's side. Um, you just have to be careful in how you lay out your case. Um, that is right. not to say that you're going to win every one of them. We filed suit just uh, two weeks ago on behalf of Metroplex Atheists down in Fort Worth. Um, where they were being prohibited. Uh, well, so they were seeking to participate in a program where the the city will hang essentially advertisements from uh, from the lampposts around downtown Fort Worth for local nonprofit organizations when they are holding events. Um, Metroplex Atheist is holding an event on the 26th of August about Christian nationalism. They wanted to promote it. They were prohibited from participating in that program because uh, the the city determined that it was not of sufficient magnitude to be advertised. Um, that was not a criteria for participating in the program. We mo we made a motion for a preliminary injunction um, to try and get the courts to decide very quickly that their banners do have to go up. The city argued that the um, that the banner program is government speech rather than um, a government run forum for um, for private speech uh, by nonprofit organizations. Um, and uh, the court essentially said that that we didn't present enough to demonstrate that we were likely to show that it isn't government speech. Um, I disagree with the court's decision, uh, but nonetheless, that is what the court decided. Um, and the standards being what they are, we decided not to appeal it. We'll proceed uh, because Met Metroplex Atheist wants to hold events in the future and advertise their events and we want to make sure they have that opportunity um so it doesn't always uh it doesn't always go your way you are limited to what facts you have available to you um obviously but um you know the uh, there there is still um room to bring our our claims these are not you know futile um, and we need to be forceful in in protecting our rights. We can't just throw up our hands and say, well, we'll wait till there's like three new members of the Supreme Court because that's a long wait and a lot of damage can be done between now and then. So, Yes, amen. I mean that in the most secular sense possible. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, and I really appreciate the work that you have done that you've told us about where you really are pushing back on these things because it it really it's encouraging to hear that yes there are legal avenues to fight things even in spaces where you know perhaps there is a very traditionalist religious conservative prevailing view uh, perhaps there are still legal arguments that can be made to defend people's rights because this is supposed to be a place where democracy prevails so thank you for your work on that um, and we do have a few questions that we should probably go to here in just a minute. But before we go to Q&A, do you have any other points that you would like to make or comments to leave us with? Um, 
no, I, I look forward to seeing what the questions are. I have unfortunately not been watching the chat. My chat hasn't even been scrolling with the new posts. It got stuck like oh, halfway up. I've got a long way to scroll. Oh, oh it happens sure. sometimes. Yeah. That's okay. We got the questions. We're, yeah, that's mean, why we incur on that. this. We're pros. <laughs> We've done this before. But um, <laughs> before we ask the questions, um, where can people find you? Would you like me to put these links into the chat that you provided us with in our outline? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm going to drop those in there. It's a, a website where you can report a legal issue. Um, and then um, let's see, you have your own uh, link. Is that a website or an email address? No, that's or... uh, so I'm not on Twitter. I have a Facebook account, but I'm never on there. Uh, that's my okay. Mastodon um, handle. Perfect. Would you like me to share that? Yeah, sure. All right. I will You're not going to, that. that's, uh, it's mostly just cat photos, but excellent you're, you're down you for the cut that yeah you may have noticed we have a lot of assistant cats uh you're you're a proper atheist you have a cat yes. <laughs> i have two of them i have two cats too yeah pro there that's the only way you're a proper atheist Kara. <laughs> i have a dog that is worth at least two cats there okay. i said it All gauntlet right. thrown <laughs> 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 but cats are cool too but you know all you're a cat cool supporter cats. and i'm a dog the closest thing we have to proof of the supernatural i think that's right well my cats yes. think they're gods so <laughs> you know <laughs> who's to say they're wrong no they're not <laughs> all right well on that note we do have questions we'll get to as many as we can um the first one Someone is asking if we can discuss the public funding of the Catholic school in Oklahoma. They believe it's in Oklahoma. And what can we do as citizens to object? Are you aware of this situation and or can you comment? I am certainly aware of it. Um, I know that um, AU and FFRF are, um, uh, are collaborating on a lawsuit to challenge exactly that. Um, uh, we're not involved in, in the lawsuit. There's, um, <laughs> I have, um, an aversion to there being too many cooks in the room and, um, FFRF and AU had people come to them who were presumably in that school district. I don't, I haven't read the, uh, the complaint as of yet, because we've had a lot going on. Um, but uh, my understanding is that they are pursuing that. If you are a parent or a student in that school district, I would absolutely reach out to them. Um, because that is uh, one of the primary ways that you can be involved and fight back if, but you have to have standing to be a plaintiff. Um, of course, if you're just, I can't sue the school district in, in, or the state of Oklahoma over this, unless I have a client who is directly affected. Um, what other people can do, what we can all do is speak up about it, point out the problem. Um, I think also we, uh, there should be more attention paid to by the atheist community to um, setting up a lot of the mechanisms that religion, because religion has been so dominant in our society for so long. Um, uh, you know, the Catholic Church has Catholic charities for social support. They have a, a whole slew of schools, um, and plenty of funding for them as well. Um, and so they are in a position to provide these services. Uh, and have their religion piggyback on it. Um, and um, there needs to be a more concerted effort. And I'm not the one to organize it. I don't have time uh, for similar support structures to be created by the atheist community for the atheist community. There's no reason that we, uh, other than funding um, and logistics that we couldn't have, you know, in school districts where there's release time for students for some students to leave and go to religious instruction with their church, why you couldn't uh, go on, uh, you know, a virtual classroom for, um, you know, and and be instructed on Bertrand Russell or uh, Spinoza, um, atheist philosophy, um, and these kinds of things. Um, the only barrier is finding the uh, capital and the willingness to to organize those kinds of things so that we can take advantage of all the same stuff that religion, uh, that religious uh, organizations are, are taking great advantage of at the moment. I hope that made sense. Mm. 
in retrospect, that might have been a little rambling, but <laughs> I, 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 it made sense to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What else do we have, Helen? Um, why is there a concern about general governmental estab establishment religion when the establishment clause concerns Congress, not state or local government? Well, so yes, um, the, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. Um, and um, uh, and so that on its face uh, suggests that it's limited only to the federal government and only the actions of the legislature. Um, it's never been interpreted to only apply to the actions of Congress. Um, uh, the um, That's just how they phrased, because they viewed the legislature as, as sort of primary um, to, I mean, it is article one of the constitution that deals with the legislature. Um, uh, that's how they worded the Bill of Rights. Uh, Congress is the one that makes the, the is the organization that makes the laws. Um, they did not have in their minds the sort of vast administrative state that has grown up out of necessity to govern and apply the laws that Congress passes in a country as large and diverse as the United States. Um, however, the Fourteenth Amendment um, says everyone is entitled to equal protection of the law um, and uh, and due process, and those clauses of the Fourteenth Amendment essentially have, have enforce federal rights against the states. Um, and um, there was a um, a long uh, process starting in the early 1900s and even extending to today to, it's referred to as incorporation, incorporate aspects of the Bill of Rights against the states, not just uh, applying to the federal government. Um, one of the more recent ones being um, uh, oh, Heller. Uh, the gun, gun rights is not my area of expertise, but that was that was one that, uh, that addressed the 14th Amendment and the Second Amendment. Um, the provisions of the uh, First Amendment were applied to the states back in the the essentially the 40s, 50s, and, and 60s. Um, that was when we had Abington School District v. Shemp, uh, Ingle v. Vitale, Tinker v. Des Moines in the free speech space um, that said the states have to abide by these First Amendment requirements just as much as the federal government. Also, many states have their own constitutional provisions that that um, mirror. The federal requirements and um, and those are enforceable as well. Um, I hope that addressed the question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and I think maybe we've got time for one more. Um, we'll say one and a half. Actually, that's it's just two. Okay, here we go. Um, I will ask you this: um, What can be done against government departments and regulators that refuse to get involved with matters involving complaints about religious groups because they don't want to be accused of the state interfering with the church? Does that make sense? Like, yes, what if, yeah, correct. that is a difficult question. Um, it, it, depending on the area, there's something called prosecutorial discretion. Um, a prosecutor has um, the discretion to. Um, enforce or not enforce the law against a person on sort of a case-by-case -case basis. However, if you can show that the law is being um, applied in such a way that a particular community is being subjected to disparate treatment based on what are called suspect classifications, um, then, uh, then even that prosecutorial discretion is violating the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection um, Clause and the Due Process Clause. Um, if uh, suspect classes are um, race, religion, um, uh, nationality, um, the uh, things that, oh, I'm, I'm straying slightly afield, so I don't have the language immediately to hand, but essentially communities that have historically been um, disfavored politically and so do not have the political clout to protect their interests on their own and are rooted mm -hmm. in what are essentially immutable traits. One cannot choose their race, one cannot choose their nationality, one cannot choose in a real conscious way their religion. Um, so um, it is 
essentially the government is prohibited from discriminating along those lines. Um, and so if a government agency is, you know, refusing to investigate, yeah, a local religious organization, let's, let's say, let's make it broad. Um, if the, IR, the IRS refusing to enforce the Johnson Amendment, which prohibits um, 501c3s from engaging in um, essentially politicking, um, endorsing candidates or, or, um, or endorsing against candidates, um, they, uh, the IRS has for a long time had a very spotty record of enforcing uh, that provision of the tax code um, and forcing them to do that is challenging um, because essentially you would, you'd need to show, you'd need to be someone who the IRS is enforcing it against and show that they are discriminating against you on the basis of religion. Um, and you'd have to have a lot of facts to back you up there. Um, of course, if they just don't enforce it across the board, there's really nothing you could do about it. <laughs> But uh, huh. in well, in short, there. <laughs> in short, there are ways to enforce to force the government to treat all organizations equally or all entities equally. Um, but you really have to have the facts to back up your claims before you can get your way into court um, or survive a motion to dismiss, um, essentially. And that's a challenge because in many instances. The government is the one with all the data, all the records, and um, you know, unless you can, through a public records request, get you know voluminous records, many of which are protected against uh, against disclosure by uh, public records laws, um, you're going to be fighting a very uh, long uphill battle. Yeah, uh, and I should mention, in a lot of instances. What you're going so when you when you're suing a government agency because they are enforcing something against you that they have not enforced against someone else, the remedy is for them to the, generally the remedy that the courts are going to provide is okay you, they can't enforce it against you either. What the courts are very rarely going to do is say okay they have to enforce it against that other person as well because that other person isn't in court in front of them that other person hasn't been participating in the litigation so mm -hmm. the court isn't going to impose something on someone totally unrelated to the litigation so very often what you wind up doing is undermining the enforcement of the law rather than enforcing the law equally and that's not what you generally want either so it's kind of a catch-22 in a lot of situations. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Very interesting. Okay. Well, on that note, Helen, would you like to ask our final question of the evening before we wrap up and go to the Hangout? Okay. So um, I think this is a good question for everybody um, that wants to get more um, involved in, um, you know, constitutional law or you know, be advocates or, um, you know, activists or whatever it is. Um, how can us laymen without the law degrees and shit help? <laughs> Sorry, I was reading, I really apologize. I was reading something in the chat. <laughs> Say that once um, more. I, I was asking that those of us that aren't, you know, doing the work that American act, um, atheists are doing that have law degrees and are actually on the front lines, like what a, us layman people um, can do to um, help fight for these certain causes that, you know, those of us, even if you're in the religious community and want that separation thing to still be a thing, like what, what can we do to be helpful? Um, to making sure that the law is fair to people that are religious and non-religious. <laughs> sure. um, so there are a few things. First, speak up. Um, the more the more people are aware of the non-religious community the, and the atheist community in particular, and the more they realize they know people who are atheist, um, the better off the community will be because people tend to respond to their you know drive for empathy more than rational arguments, unfortunately. Um, so if you're in a position where you're able to safely be vocal about your your atheism, your how how the government's actions uh, affect you 
as an atheist, um, speak up about it, vote, vote for candidates who support the separation of religion and government. I won't endorse or, or um, uh, advise against voting for any specific candidates, but keep that issue in mind mm -hmm. when you're voting. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say become a member of uh, an organization. Um, you can donate to American Atheists and support our work directly. Um, run for office. That's always an option yeah. as well. Um, well, assuming you're old enough for whatever office you're running for. <laughs> Fair point. Fair um, point. Yeah. Be active is, is is essentially what it comes down to. Awesome. Well, I think we will endeavor to do so after having heard from all of your advice this evening. And I am coming away feeling encouraged that there actually are battles that can be won here and that the law may be on the side of keeping government and religion separate. So thank you for sharing that with us. A little bit of a, a nice bright light in the darkness <laughs> so. I, I like i was really inspired after you flow because i was listening to you guys and all the work that you've been doing um and i really wanted to introduce that to our community because i think that there's a lot of rhetoric going on that is very frustrating to a lot of people and um i think that those of us that are feeling that frustration forget there are people in the in the background that are actually doing some fucking work and i think that it's also inspiring for us to like you know to do our work and you know get off our butts and start you know promoting for the things that we want to like you like if you want to be the change in the world you gotta do some fucking work people i'm just saying <laughs> yeah. and, and i hasten to add those frustrations are well founded um i don't i don't want to sugarcoat anything for anyone it, this is going to be a long hard slog getting out of what the last 20 years of Supreme Court nominees uh, and, a, and a totally dysfunctional Congress have have done to the landscape, but um, it is doable. It's just going to take buckling down and doing the hard work or supporting the hard work. Yeah. And we appreciate the work you were doing. So thank you for doing that and for taking the time away from that to come talk to us. And Happy uh, to. yeah, this is great. And uh, I think you said you were going to be able to stick around a little bit for the hangout. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. So if we didn't get to some questions, feel free to ask them in the Hangout. We'll be here. So we'll go ahead and wrap up real quick. And uh, don't forget, everyone, to join us next week, same time, same place. And uh, we'll be talking about thinking, epistemology, science literacy, and illiteracy, and how we get around to believing or not believing some silly things. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking about that next week. So join us there. And if you need more RFRX in your life between now and then, find us on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and catch up on some older episodes. We've been doing this for years. We have talked about a lot of things, so catch up on some of those. And if you have questions, comments, ideas for future shows or topics that you'd like to see, don't forget to email us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And as always, you can find even more content on our blog and our podcast. Now, Helen, for those of us who are able to use the social medias, where might they find us on the interwebs? Okay, so I know all you people are super um, social network savvy. Is a Vicara who can't use Discord. <laughs> I'm getting better. I'm, I'm just getting better. It takes a lot of practice for me. I have to try harder I can, I can at things that. that normal people can do easily. Listen, if I don't tease you, I don't love you. So anyway, <laughs> if you want to help engage with recovery and religion, refer people to us. Um, we have our Facebook main page. We also have our Facebook support group page, which has um, both pages have our agents on there, but like the support group be page lists all where our support groups are what's coming up and all that jazzy stuff and the facebook main page gives you an update on what's going on with recovering from religion we are on twitter or x i'm still going to call it twitter i will not call it x because elon is terrible and i'm just going to call it twitter mm -hmm. um we're also on instagram and we're also on the tiktok so if you would like to um engage with rfr um share share like also if you know someone that's dealing with 
um, doubt and um, non-belief and need some resources, direct them to our socials or direct them to our website. So, you know, I'm just gonna shill for that. So um, we're gonna pull the feedback poll. Um, this gives us an idea of um, how people are engaging with the program and how much you like us. So number one, um, this program was relevant to me. One, nope, this sucked, hated it. This was dumb. I don't know why you did this program. Five, yes, this was so amazing. I love this program. Yes, I thought this topic was fantastic. Two, to two three, four is a gauge of how relevant it was. So, you know, check your feelings. Two, the speaker was clear and understandable. One, you have a banana phone or you're talking to tin cans and you couldn't hear crap. Or five, all the way to five, which is clear and understandable. This sounded like this mofo was sitting right next to me. I could completely understand everything they were saying. And two to four is a gauge on your volume settings and also how where your air for, ear, earphones or speakers are working. So I'm just gonna see, this probably what's going on. <laughs> Okay, number three, I will definitely intend a future programs like this. One, no, fuck you. I didn't like this at all. I will not be back. Five, yes, I love it here. Everybody's amazing. I will be back and I will let other people know about it as well. Two, to, two three, four, search your feelings. See how you feel about it. Uh, it's a gauge. I understand that. And five, how did you find our four i can count it's number four it's number four how did you find rfrx tonight one through the um velvet rope that you got beyond it and you are now part of the online community or slack channel at rfr um through the meetups um through facebook twitter or instagram so you are with the socials through the discord the rfr website or other like you had a bird fly into your house and sit on your shoulder and be like, hey, hey, person, go to RFRF and join their wonderful podcast series. So however you gauge, you know, please vote because this actually this I'm joking around, but this actually really does help us um, understand our demographics and, you know, um, how people are engaging with us, which is super helpful. Now I'm going to introduce our wonderful founder, president of Recovering from Religion, Dr. Ray, who has come out from under the rocks to join us this week. Welcome back, Dr. Ray. Um, please give us your feedback, all that jazzy stuff and so on. And I'm done talking now. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Yeah, I'm back. I've been uh, gone for the better part of three weeks, but fun to, fun to be back now. And Jeff, thank you so much for coming here and giving us your time and your expertise. Uh, it's always good to hear from you. And I think you communicate very clearly in a way that most people can understand what the law is and why it's important to us individually. Um, but I'm glad we, I'm glad Kara twisted your arm or I'm sorry, Helen twisted your arm and got here, got you here. You know, when I, my observation is when people leave religion, they oftentimes see the world in totally different ways. I can't tell you how many people in my career, uh, you know, as in my work with people in recovery from religion, have told me, "Wow, my my worldview changed dramatically. My politics changed dramatically. My view of the society changed dramatically." And and, and, and that's great. I'm glad to hear that uh, because most people report they're seeing the world through clear glasses rather than the, the glasses of religion. But the second piece is they oftentimes see, wow, now I realize how much religion fucks up society, how much it hurt me, how much it hurt my family, you know, how much it is always interfering with my schools or my child's education and the funding. And there's all sorts of things that are going on because the religion is always trying to interfere. If you've ever read my book, The God Virus, I document it pretty clearly there. But um, the reason I mention all that is this is, this is a reason for you to get active, to do something. Recover from religion is here to help people recover. But once you've recovered, once you got your feet back on the ground, I hope you'll say, where can I help? And everybody listening to my voice right now can help. And one way you can help is you can go volunteer, 
in some way for uh, American atheists, or you can donate directly to American atheists. Uh, you know, you get their newsletter, you can see what they're doing on online and see what kind of cases they're involved in. And there's a lot of things you can do. And you don't have to be out in a public eye, you know, like Gail was when she ran for office in Tennessee. But I'm telling you what Gail did had a huge impact on a lot of people. We know that people have run for office in their home districts because Gail did what she did. We had people tell us I ran for office because of you, Gail. So you don't have to be a Gail and you don't have to run for office, but you can help people educate people just like Jeff's educated us. We can turn around and educate other people and we can volunteer for Freedom from Religion Foundation, American Atheists. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good secular groups out there that you can work with. Anyway, I've been a fan of AA for decades. Uh, Jeff, I was a fan of AA uh, back in 1963. I didn't realize I was, but uh, when Madeline Murray O'Hare was um, first founding AA. American Atheist, not Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> We all know Daryl's a big fan of Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, right. Yeah, huge fan. You're always like saying there, like, yeah, join that. Don't join secular recovery. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I I, I really endorse uh, everything Jeff's been talking about and the American atheists and what they're trying to do.